They say that for everything there is a season, but try telling that to a farmer in Niger this year. Normally, Hassam's millet harvest will yield enough to feed his family for a year, but this time it will only last three months. We say if the rainy season is good, the grass is good like this, but now it's small like it's small. this. Drought has caused crop failure throughout the Sahel, and the effects are already being felt at the market nearby. Millet prices have risen by 30 percent since the same time last year. Even in the best of times, poor education and bad diet keep the beds full of severely malnourished children at this hospital in nearby Doso. The red means they may never reach their full potential. Another generation blighted by hunger. The devastated harvest has authorities watching out for an increase in admissions. Niger struggles with some of the highest rates in population growth and poverty. A drought like this year can set many people over the edge from hunger into starvation. The last thing they need is another hungry mouth to feed. No food. No food. No eat. But that's exactly what is happening. I go to one end is young. Abdul was working as a garbage collector in Libya. During the uprising, he barely escaped a lynch mob. He was evacuated by ship and then airlifted back to Niger. He has five children and his wife is in the hospital. Now back home with no job, he can't pay her hospital bill, much less finish the house he was building with the remittances he was sending from Libya. Hunger is forcing people to leave their homes, looking for work in Nigeria, Benin, and the Ivory Coast. In this town, only women, children, and the elderly remain. Now even they have had enough. This woman says she has decided to go to the capital, Miami, to sell sand. It doesn't have to be this way. Just a few kilometers away in Garbi Malau Koya, tomatoes are growing in the desert. The World Food Program paid these women with food to reclaim a silted lake. Now it provides water, life, and hope. But humanitarian organizations are fighting the perception that places like Niger are basket cases, that there's no point in trying to help. Nobody's asking the World Food Program for a free handout in Niger. Nobody. Not the government, not the local authorities, and certainly not the women in the community. They're not asking us for a free handout. They're asking us for some assistance so that they can stay in their homes, in their villages, work in their fields, maintain their families, and keep their life going. Niger's future begins and ends here. Meals given to these children at school ensures that they can concentrate on learning instead of their hungry stomachs. If tomatoes can flourish in the desert, then so can they. This is Jonathan Dumont for Hungry Planet. Rose Mensah is waiting for cars to stop on the main road from Benin to Togo. She is not the only one selling fried fish and shrimps. The competition is steep and fish in Lake Ahimi are getting scarce. Rose, mother of four, was struggling to make a living, but now she has embarked on a new activity which she hopes will enable her to leave the roadside market once and for all. Three years ago, she took advantage of an innovative project and turned from fish seller to rabbit breeder. She was given training and started off with three females and one male rabbit. Today, she has over 200. I can sell up to 30 rabbits a month. With the money I run the house, pay for my children's school, and still have some left to set aside just in case. Rose lives on the shores of Lake Ahimi, one of a network of lagoons in southern Benin, West Africa, and the main source of sustenance and livelihood for the local population. But now there are only small fish left, and not enough to go around. Growing communities have led to overfishing. The villages, encroaching the shores, have destroyed the mangroves which once provided natural shelter and breeding grounds for fish, and soil erosion is filling the lake with sand. 
Before there was a lot of money to be made with fish, but now the fishermen only catch small fish and sometimes come back with none at all. With over 600,000 fisher folk in Benin facing extreme poverty, the United Nations International Fund for Agricultural Development, or EFAD, funded a project in 2004 to rehabilitate the natural resources, reduce fishing, and help people like Rose find alternative ways to make a living. So far, over 2,000 fisher folk have been trained to take up new professions. Cutting down on the amount of fishing was only part of the solution. To increase fish numbers and size, the degraded lakes and wetlands needed to be reclaimed. Farmers were provided with tech and acacia seedlings to plant, and water canals were constructed to combat soil erosion. But fish also need refuges to feed and breed, so mangroves were planted and fish shelters created. They started selling fish, producing firewood. They were creating their own resources and making money. And people started saying, if we knew this was possible, we would have begun earlier. Since the beginning of this project, over 10,000 Fisher families have been reached, but a further 80,000 are still in need of an opportunity to escape poverty and improve their lives. Change takes time, and fishing for these communities is part of their heritage. Meanwhile, Rose still goes twice a week to buy fish, which she cooks in the evening to sell at the market. But she no longer sees fish as her future. She is planning on expanding her business to become one of Benin's top rabbit breeders. For Hungry Planet, I'm Sam Cole. Rwanda's Volcanoes National Park attracts thousands of visitors each year. Today, conservationist Ian Redmond and wildlife officer Edgar Kaislin from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization will meet the inhabitants of these forests. What's happening is that uh, we're within a very short distance of the family of gorillas who have just recently been feeding here. This is all where gorillas have been feeding. There's bits of celery and they, uh, they peel the celery and eat the inside part and taste like celery. Unlike us, mountain gorillas are strict vegetarians. They feed on more than 200 species of plants, some of which only grow in these wet, high-altitude equatorial rainforests. Gorillas are so closely adapted to this habitat, they cannot live anywhere else. Thanks to relentless efforts to protect the gorillas and their ecosystem, their numbers have risen steadily over recent years to a total of almost 800 individuals. But now climate change threatens that success. Mountains like, like islands, they, they are very much affected by, by climate change. And in particular, uh, in Africa, there have been estimates that uh, the average increase in, in temperature will be more than in other parts of the world. So it is, of course, expected uh, that um, due to warming, the vegetation might move up upwards and the animals probably have little chances as than to, to follow uh, their uh, ideal and preferred habitat. In this scenario, they will be pushed further up the mountain until there's nowhere left to go. Rwanda is Africa's most densely populated country. Its rapidly growing population, combined with the fact that the majority of its people are subsistence farmers, create massive demand for land. Furthermore, Rwanda's hilly landscape is prone to erosion. The challenge facing Rwanda and the mountain gorillas is not unique. A new report by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, warns that up to a third of all animal and plant species worldwide are at risk of extinction due to climate change. But there are successes here that serve as examples of how to preserve wildlife in a changing climate. These projects acknowledge the needs of both people and animals. Matthew Munyarazi belongs to the Batwa, a community of traditional hunter-gatherers. Matthew and the gorillas used to share a common resource, but today there is simply not enough forest left to sustain hunting and gathering together with the gorillas' habitat. This project has allocated land to the Batwa, where they can grow trees which shelter crops and can be used for firewood, building materials and handicrafts. 
Nubwo duhinga ariko kandi ntabwo twiza nyine ibiduhagije neza ariko kandi turahinga niko kazi dufite We have turned into farmers. That's how we feed our families. If we cannot earn enough from farming, we do handcraft, which we sell to visitors, or we help out other farmers. That's how we get by. This project alone has seen a quarter of a million trees planted over the last four years. In this way, Matthew and his fellow Batwa people contribute to the reforestation of Rwanda. The forests then act as a carbon sink, helping mitigate climate change, while also storing water for the country. In the face of climate change, projects like these are becoming increasingly important for the well-being of wildlife and for the world's growing population. As the FAO report stresses, only healthy ecosystems may be able to withstand and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Be it gorillas or polar bears, Climate change threatens wildlife all over the planet. If the appropriate measures are not swiftly implemented, we might be the last generation to witness the wealth of biodiversity this planet still harbors. For Hungry Planet, this is Charlotte Windle.